From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The U.S. Supreme Court restores Donald Trump to the Colorado presidential ballot in a unanimous decision. Only Congress can ban a federal candidate for office based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the so-called Insurrectionist Clause. The court rules. Plus, on the eve of Super Tuesday primaries, a spate of polls show President Biden is trailing Donald Trump in all of them. Is Joe Biden now an underdog for reelection? Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal here with colleagues Kim Strassel and Kyle Peterson. We'll take up those issues today. But first, let's start with the Supreme Court decision. It's a landmark decision expected for the most part after the oral arguments at the court in the case Trump v. Anderson, where Trump was appealing the Supreme Court of Colorado's decision to bar him from the ballot. They did so based on the fact that under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which of course is the post-Civil War Amendment, someone who was engaged in insurrection can be disqualified from serving as a federal officer. And the Colorado Supreme Court said courts could do it. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a per curiam opinion, which means it's unsigned today, said the state's cannot do this. Only Congress, through implementing legislation, can bar a federal candidate for office. States can bar state candidates for state office, but not federal officers. And the argument they resorted to here, I'll just quote a little bit from the opinion. It says, the result of different states eliminating candidates based on different criteria in each state could well be that a single candidate would be declared ineligible in some states, but not others based on the same conduct. The patchwork that would likely result from state enforcement would sever the direct link the framers found so critical between the national government and the people of the United States as a whole. Kyle, what do you make of the opinion? I think the first thing that's notable about it is that it is unanimous on the point about Colorado saying that Colorado cannot kick Trump off the ballot. And basically, you'd have a situation where states could disqualify candidates for public office for the country as a whole. The per curiam opinion also makes the argument that giving states that authority would invert the 14th Amendment's rebalancing of federal and state power, because remember, this was an amendment that was passed after the Civil War, and it was intended to allow the federal government to do a better job of enforcing and protecting people's civil rights that states were trampling on. The part that is most notable other than that, I think, is that the majority of the court goes a little bit further and also says essentially that this disqualification provision of the 14th Amendment is not self-executing, meaning that courts cannot just rely on it to disqualify candidates. It requires some sort of other legislation from Congress explaining who is disqualified and how that is supposed to work. And that is what drew the concurrences. So there is concurrence from Justice Amy Coney Barrett saying that she thinks this case does not require us to address the complicated question whether federal legislation is the exclusive vehicle through which Section 3 can be enforced. And then that is also taken up by the three liberal justices who have a longer explanation saying much the same thing. Yeah, Kim, I mean, it is unanimous, and that's the fundamental takeaway here based on the argument that the states cannot bar candidates for federal office. Amy Coney Barrett makes that clear. All nine justices agree on the outcome of this case. That is the message Americans should take home. And yet, as Kyle said, she did file a concurrence saying the court did not need to get into the question of how that Congress, per se, through passing a legislation, is the only way you can disqualify a candidate. And then the three liberals, she didn't elaborate on that in her very brief opinion, but then the three liberals go further than that and seem to suggest that judicial enforcement through prosecutors could be a way of enforcing the Section 3, the Insurrection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And they chide the court for going further than they say it had to. Introduces a mildly discordant note in an otherwise unanimous opinion. Yeah, it does sit uneasily because not only do they make that point, they lead with it. They only get to the substance of the per curiam opinion later in this edition that they did. But the beginning of it is their complaint that the court not only, as you say, says that Colorado can't do this, but then adds with some detail information on which federal actors can enforce Section 3 and how that they must go about doing 
doing so when they said it was unnecessary. Look, this is the liberals on the court liking to preserve. They liked this opinion and they were willing to join it in the end. I want to point this out because Let's not forget, and this was wise of John Roberts to go down this road, that liberal justices tend to be much more skeptical of states' rights anyway. And so this is a a more natural conclusion for them to reach that federal government has exclusive power here. Their frustration in the end is that they'd like their own branch, the judiciary, to be able to make those decisions if need be, because they'd like to retain some sort of authority, if necessary, to get rid of a guy like Donald Trump um, if it was a federal judiciary doing that. I still think that's very dangerous. I think it was probably, look, if the court was going to go down this road, make the decision, why not spell out exactly who was supposed to be doing this so that we can forestall another situation in which we have the Supreme Court having to come back to this issue and further make judgment as to which actors are allowed to do this and when. Very good point. Let me read a line from the concurrence by Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson. By resolving these and other questions, the majority attempts to insulate all alleged insurrectionists from future challenges to their holding federal office, unquote. I don't think that that is actually true. They don't resolve all those questions. They don't insulate all alleged insurrectionists. They just say that if you're going to bar them from federal office, Congress has to do it. Right. (laughs) As Congress has done in the past, by the way, I would know. Right. And they say that. But I think the key point here is what this means is that a federal prosecutor who decided, you know what, we want to bar this candidate could be a member of Congress, not just a presidential candidate or a Senate candidate, participate in an insurrection, and I'm going to charge him or her with insurrection, and if convicted, therefore would be barred. The majority opinion, I think, Kyle, forestalls that. Yes, it looks like it does. And to give the liberals the due of this argument, what they say is that, look, the 14th Amendment contains all sorts of other provisions and guarantees, and nobody thinks that Congress needs to pass legislation setting those out. And this disqualification clause says that if somebody is disqualified for committing insurrection, Congress may remove that by two thirds vote of each house. And so I think their best argument is if Congress thought that you needed a majority to pass some kind of legislation to put this section into effect, then why would it be two thirds to remove? Because they could just remove it by never passing the legislation to put it into effect in the first place. I think what the majority's response to that is, is that there was some litigation after this about whether this was in effect and how it applied after the Civil War. And there was one Supreme Court justice who was acting as a circuit rider and had an opinion saying that it was not self-executing. And even if you think that's wrong from a originalist standpoint, that has been the history. That's how this clause has been interpreted. And it was interesting. The person who was right on point of this, I think, during the oral argument was Justice Brett Kavanaugh who was saying that when Congress passed the legislation to put Section 3 into effect in 1870, I believe, it was acting against this backdrop of legislation. And so that liquidates the meaning of this clause. And the legal theory of liquidation is that if you have a legislative provision that has some ambiguity in it, if you have 150 years almost a precedent of how it is playing out in reality, then that interpretation holds. I should, for the sake of the listeners, when Kyle refers to the disqualification clause and I refer to the insurrection clause, we're really talking about the same thing. 